On this episode of A New York Minute in History... Interestingly, we find a lot of mastodon skeletons in ponds or boggy environments, a lot of times in people's backyards. This is sort of like a celebrity discovery, right? People are coming from all over to look at this. And in fact, they're willy-nilly ripping bones out at the Marl Pit. We dig into the story of an early mastodon excavation in Orange County. It's all up next, right after this. From the Irish invasion of Canada to the early days of the movies. If you are interested in broadening your understanding of New York State history, then this is the podcast for you. I'm Susan Hughes, historian and archivist for the William G. Pomeroy Foundation, a proud sponsor of a New York Minute in History. One of our main initiatives is to help people celebrate their community's history by providing grants for historic markers and plaques. Here in the Empire State and across the country, we support a diverse range of marker programs that include commemorating food history, civil rights, folklore, and sites on the National Register of Historic Places. As the nation's leading funder of historic markers, the Pomeroy Foundation has awarded over 1,800 grants since 2005. To learn more about the Foundation's grant programs, visit WGPFoundation.org. That's WGPFoundation.org. Welcome to a New York Minute in History. I'm Devin Lander, the New York State historian. And I'm Lauren Roberts, the historian for Saratoga County. We are very excited because we have a new season For our listeners, we have many new stories to tell. Luckily, New York State is full of history, full of interesting topics. We have no shortage of material to bring you. So today, we're taking things back in time a little bit farther than we usually do by a few thousand years. For this episode, our focus takes us to a marker in the town of Montgomery in Orange County along State Route 17K. The title of the marker is Mastodon Dig, and the text reads, Charles W. Peel, with support of President Thomas Jefferson, uncovered bones here in 1801, later exhibited at American Philosophical Society, William G. Pomeroy Foundation, 2020. So today we're talking about an early mastodon discovery in Orange County and its connections to some pretty well-known Americans But before we get into the details of the particular discovery, Devin, maybe you can help me out here. Can you tell me what exactly is a mastodon? When did it live? Because obviously it's now extinct. They're not walking around New York State. And maybe what's the difference between a mastodon and a woolly mammoth? Right. Those are great questions. And and that's kind of where I began as well, going back to the basics. What is the difference between a mastodon and a woolly mammoth, as you noted? I think we vaguely know that there are two separate things, but somebody like me who's a historian and not a scientist, I kind of have only a peripheral view of, of these creatures. So I sat down with my colleague, Dr. Bob Frannick from the New York State Museum, who told us more. Broadly, paleontology is the study of ancient life. More specifically, paleontology can be broken down into different subfields. So at the State Museum, we have an invertebrate paleontologist, Dr. Lisa Amati. So she studies things that more or less don't have bones. Mm -hmm. While I'm a vertebrate paleontologist, my field of study is more or less things that had bones. Mastodons are a taxon of elephant-like creatures that first split off from the elephant line about 25 million years ago. Um, The family is called Mammutidae. Mammut is the genus for the the animal that we're ultimately going to be talking about, which is the American mastodon, Mammut americanum. I think when people think of mammoths or mastodons, they just think in general of these hairy elephant-like critters. And the mammoths broke off about 5 million years ago. They're only distantly related to each Mm. other. And skeletally, you can see distinct differences among those. So if you know what you're looking at, you can see these distinct differences. Mammoth teeth are very similar, almost exactly the same as elephant teeth. They're made up of what we call loafs, and they're more flattened, and they have enamel ridges and put in plates. They are used to grind down 
grasses and sedges. And mm -hmm. here they would have been living in tundra environments, so mm -hmm. low-lying tundra plants. Mastodon teeth are cusped, more like your teeth right. and my teeth. So they have points on them. And those were used for crushing rather than grinding. They did live in the similar time period in New York State and across North America, but they occupied different habitats. So mammoths would have been out more out in the open, while mastodons were more kind of a deep forest animal. Interestingly, we find a lot of mastodon skeletons or pieces of mastodons in ponds or boggy environments, a lot of times in people's backyards. So they'll, they'll have a pond in their backyard and they don't want it to be a pond in their backyard anymore. And they'll drain it. And at the bottom of that pond, there's a mastodon living wow. in it. The development of these ponds from the glacial environments seems to have gone through a relatively common sequence. So at first, after the glacier, you have a development of like clays. And then just above that, which is more recent in time, you have this amaral sediment. Mm -hmm. And amaral sediment is like a calcium carbonate-dominated sediment. It precipitates out of the boggy environment and deposits on top of that clay. After that marl is deposited, a lot of times you find in the ponds peat, which is kind of indicative of a bog or kind of a marshy type of environment. And we think that's really what the mastodons here in New York State would have loved to have lived in. We think that they were kind of living in these boggy, marshy environments and then died for some old age, or maybe they got stuck, or maybe later on we'll find out a human was chasing them. They died in this pond or this bog. And the marl is kind of squishy enough that when the animal dies, it kind of sinks into that sediment. I think also that the marl has a type of environmental condition that is good for preserving these types of bones. The earliest discovery of a mastodon tooth by colonists took place in Claverack, New York, in 1705. Of course, indigenous people had long known of these types of fossils, but for the colonists, it was something new. At that time, it was thought that these teeth were those of giants described in the Bible. We have to remember that at this time, there was no real understanding of any type of evolution. It was believed that extinction itself was impossible, since it would mean that God designed something that failed. Similar fossils were being found in Europe and other parts of the world, so there was an understanding eventually over time that these were creatures that used to live in North America. Also, we're calling it a mastodon. We know that that's what it's called now. But at the time, when you look at the literature that was written, they're referring to it as a mammoth and sometimes as the American incognitum because they didn't really know what it was. It wasn't until later that they made the distinction that these were actually mastodon fossils. Okay, so let's talk about the 1801 discovery of the Orange County mastodon. It seems a little odd that Orange County was in a rural area pretty far away from New York City, you know, the big urban center at the time. So how did these big names like Charles Wilson Peel and Thomas Jefferson get involved in this excavation on a farmer's field far away from a major city? What it comes down to is a kind of war of words between naturalists and learned men on two different continents. On one side, you have the French nobleman and scientist, the Comte du Buffon, who proposed a theory called American degeneracy in 1755. The theory basically stated that nature in the New World was inferior to that of Europe and that the Americas lacked the large land animals whose bones had been found in Europe and still existed in places like Africa and Asia. Buffon even suggested that the people of the New World, including the colonists, were less virile than Europeans. We spoke with Dr. Bernard K. Means, an assistant professor of anthropology at Virginia Commonwealth University. The Comte Buffon, he argued that the entire New World sapped the vitality of everything living in it and had been since the Americas, for him, were new, quote unquote, newly risen out of the water. Everything in the Americas was considered by him to be weaker, smaller, right? So, you know, I mean, when people say like size matters, I mean, this is actually literally true. 
And probably one of the biggest insults is, is he talked about how degeneracy made men more effeminate. Obviously, this theory did not sit well with the Founding Fathers, particularly Thomas Jefferson, who became kind of obsessed with this. You know, you want to produce goods, that you want to be able to trade with people. You want skilled artisans and people with all kinds of talents to come to your new nation. And how are you going to get people to buy your goods if they're somehow considered to be tainted? How are you going to get people to come to your country if they think that they and their children will be impacted? Jefferson goes to Paris and he brings what he refers to as uncommonly large panther skin with him to try to show it to Buffon and say, look, we have a big cat. Buffon's response was, your cats don't have beards. They don't have manes, so therefore they're not masculine. There's a period during the revolution where Franklin is in France. He's at a dinner. He and a bunch of Americans are sitting on one side of the table and French are sitting on the other side of the table. And apparently Franklin challenged everybody to stand because he knew all the Americans were taller. But the French did not take him up on that. Jefferson actually gets somebody to kill a moose for him. But they like dragged it 20 miles through the woods. And by the time he got to Jefferson, it must have been pretty decrepit looking. But we don't actually know that uh, what Buffon thought of this stinky moose carcass because he died. Now, while he dies, the theory of American degeneracy lives on. And so they were looking, they were finding these fossils and they became very sort of concerned. Here we have something big. We don't quite know what it is, but it's going to help us prove that we have something bigger than anything known at that time. The issue, and this is, this is, will sort of segue us into Peel. The issue is they were mostly finding teeth. They didn't find like, you know, complete skeletons. We all know the names of Thomas Jefferson, George Washington, Ben Franklin, but Charles Wilson Peale may be a name that's less familiar to our listeners. Devin, can you tell us a little bit about who Charles Wilson Peale was and why he's important? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Charles Wilson Peale was a prominent painter. He was born in 1741 in the British colony of Maryland. He's really known as an artist for painting many of the founding fathers. Besides being an artist, Peale was a bit of a Renaissance man. He had a great interest in natural history, and after the revolution, he opened what is now considered to be the first museum that was open to the public in the United States, which began operations in 1786 in Philadelphia. In the museum, Peel displayed his artwork, along with the work of others, as well as a variety of animal specimens, archaeological artifacts, and fossils. Another connection between the Founding Fathers and Charles Wilson Peale was the American Philosophical Society. This society is known as the oldest learned society in the United States. It was founded by Ben Franklin in 1743. We might think that the American Philosophical Society was where people would meet to talk about philosophy, but actually they were focusing on the study of nature. So this would have been naturalists, scientists that were interested in the world around them, the scientific world around them. And many founding fathers were members, uh, not just Thomas Jefferson, but also Adams, Alexander Hamilton, Thomas Paine, someone who we've talked about in a previous episode. And so it was a prestigious society. They were actually given space right in Independence Square in Philadelphia, where they built Philosophical Hall in the 1780s. So the connection for this particular dig in 1801 between Jefferson and Charles Wilson Peel really stems from their both being members of the American Philosophical Society. So let's talk a little bit about the uh, excavation. Well, in 1799, a farmer discovered some Macedon fossils, and this discovery made the newspapers, and Peel believed that he could potentially uncover an intact skeleton. So with support from the American Philosophical Society, he traveled to Orange County in 1801. And he said, look, we need to excavate this Mastodon. And so he gets permission from John Maston to try to dig out more of the Marl Pit. This is sort of like a celebrity, you know, discovery, right? People are coming from all over to look at this. And in fact, they're willy-nilly ripping bones out at the Marl Pit. He knew he was going to have to bring in some help. And one of the things he did was write to Thomas Jefferson to ask for 
the use of pumps. He thought because it was such a, a watery area that the use of large pumps would help him to pump the water out. And Thomas Jefferson actually agreed to help him by sending these pumps. However, in the meantime, Peel had devised a plan to build a wheel that would use buckets, basically, and the power of humans turning this wheel, kind of like a hamster wheel idea, to be able to remove the water from the site so they could continue the excavation. He actually describes this contraption to Jefferson in a letter The idea instantly occurred of a chain of buckets carried round an axis, pouring the lifted water into a trough, communicating to the basin. And he's referring to a pond here he's going to dump the water into. The power of raising the weight of which, obtained by a wheel of 20 feet diameter, of a width for men to walk within as a squirrel in a cage. So the men would walk in the wheel, turning the wheel, and that would propel the buckets out of the morass and then dump them into the corresponding pond. He's a showman. You know, he wants to get people engaged. He wants people to feel like they're part of what they're doing. And so people come and they run inside of this hamster wheel and help pump out the water. This particular morass that he refers to, the skeleton within it was not complete. So he did have to go to some other Morrow pits in the local area, and by going to those places and getting more bones, he actually had enough at the end to make two mastodon skeletons. It took him several months to actually put the skeletons together because although it was the most complete skeletons of mastodon that have been found, they weren't 100% complete, so they had to fabricate missing pieces and, and bones, and that was done by Rembrandt Peel, his son. Charles Wilson Peel and Rembrandt Peel and uh, Rubens Peel, their enslaved servant Moses Williams, who uh, Charles Wilson Peel credits with being particularly good at sort of piecing the bones together. Casper Wister, uh, who's a prominent physician in Philadelphia and also basically a leading paleontologist himself, is involved. And he had actually done the same thing for sort of a tangent Jefferson was sent bones in 1796 from what is now West Virginia from an animal with giant claws, which Jefferson was convinced was a giant lion. He gave a presentation about this giant lion, and he was about to publish it, and Casper Wister goes, you know, there's some report coming out of South America. I think what you have is a giant ground sloth. And it turns out it was, in fact, a giant ground sloth. So not, not a meat eater. And then they get William Rush, who was making a name for himself as a carver. And he actually carves bones out of wood, as does the Peel Sons and as does Moses Williams, to uh, replace bones that they're missing. So they have more than one mass on skeleton, and they reconstruct the most complete one, but they use the other skeleton to help them sort of figure out what the bones should look like that they're missing. And so the mass on that gets reconstructed is a mixture of actual fossils, some wooden bones, and the very top of its skull is reconstructed in plaster. Using wood was actually kind of a unique thing to be done at that time. But I should also point out that the Mastodon that Peel and his team put together is only the second fossil reconstruction done anywhere in the world of any type. The skeletons were accurate, except that Rembrandt Peel insisted that the tusk be placed in such a way that would suggest that the Mastodon was a carnivore. So he put the tusks in facing the wrong way so that they were facing down because this carnivore would use the tusks for battle, but would also use them to dig rodents or shellfish out of areas. And that, again, they were hopeful in a way that this creature was a carnivore. Of course, that was incorrect. And over time, they did acquiesce to the reality that the tusks would fit much like a modern elephant. He was so adamant on this. He actually, in the title of the paper that he writes about this excavation, he refers to it as a carnivorous animal. The title, which may be one of the longest titles ever, is An Historical Disquisition on the Mammoth or Great American Incognitum, an extinct, immense, carnivorous animal whose fossil remains have been found in North America. (laughs) <laughs> they had this mass on reconstructed 
it premieres to the members of the American Philosophical Society who helped fund the expedition on Christmas Eve, uh, 1801. And then it opens up to the public the next day, on Christmas Day. And it's popular. It's the dinosaur craze of the day. Here's this giant skeleton, the largest animal known to exist anywhere in the Americas. Peel actually charged extra money for people to see it. It was in a separate room. This is probably hyperbole, but apparently women were fainting when they saw how big this thing was. There's literally what becomes referred to as a mammoth craze, and it's because of the mastodon we actually have the word mammoth used to mean something large. Going back to uh, kind of the impetus behind this discovery was to dispel the theory of American degeneracy. Did it have that effect in Europe? Not by everybody. (laughs) Uh, There was actually a guy who was trying to get in good with the king of Prussia. And he was really pushing the theory of American degeneracy uh, well into the 1850s because the king of Prussia was trying to encourage immigration to Prussia. Mm. Uh, But eventually, people are becoming more scientific. Mm -hmm. We have Cuvier, we have Lamarck, Mm -hmm. uh, we have Darwin, we have Humboldt, we have Franklin. Franklin, by the way, who was seen as proof of American degeneracy (laughs) because he was widely recognized as the smartest man in America. And if there wasn't American degeneracy, we should have more than one genius in the Americas. <laughs> which, is, which is, you know, you know how it is. You can bend the evidence to whatever you want. So it, it begins to sort of wane throughout the 1830s, maybe well after, you know, the founding fathers are all dead. Mm-hmm. And, of course, we start seeing dinosaurs being discovered. Right. Um, and those are truly massive animals. And, and some of the major dinosaurs are from out in the western U.S., you know, so you have mm-hmm. T-Rex. You have triceratops. You have these clearly really big animals. And so Buffon's theories, you know, really seem dated and quaint. Not being a scientist, I wasn't really sure how this episode was going to play out before we started doing the research for it. But it actually turned into a really interesting prehistoric and historic story. Lauren, I agree. This episode really turned into a really interesting story and in, about the history of science, but also a conflict between uh, Europe and the United States or what became the United States, uh, the role of very prominent founders in science and early naturalism in, in this continent and how that played out as well. It also kind of makes me look at things like our own mastodon skeleton, the Cahos mastodon, which we have at the New York State Museum now, and any school group in the capital region has seen that, but it really makes you look at it in a different way and understand what these large fossils symbolized even beyond their actual scientific importance. And we're still discovering mastodon fossils today. Dr. Ferranic says the remains of over 160 individual mastodons have been discovered in New York State alone. I would say every couple of years we get notification that somebody's found one. There was one, I think, found in 2017, a fairly complete specimen um, that was excavated on a, on a farm. In 2009, um, there was a, another farmer that was boating down the Wallkill River and noticed that there was a tusk coming out of the river. And so far, actually, they turned out to be the oldest. We radiocarbon dated them. And so far, they're the oldest specimens that we know. They Radiocarbon dated to, I think, 12,900 radiocarbon years ago, and that's about 14,500 years from the present. Why do we think mastodons and mammoths as a species or species died out? I have my own personal, and I, I think it's accurate. There's been a long debate as to whether humans were the major cause or yeah. climate change was the major cause, particularly in North America. Mammoths and mastodons are part of a large extinction that happens in North America. Over 50 taxa of large animals go extinct at the end of the what we call the Pleistocene epoch. In New York State, we think these animals went extinct about 12,000 years ago. And for me, you have these two things kind of working in tandem. At the end of the Pleistocene epoch, we go from a really cold environment, and it starts to warm up. And it warms up fairly quickly. And then for about 1,500 years, it reverts back to 
a glacial environment. We call mm. that period the Younger Dryas. Mm. And so it's warming up, and then it reverts back to a cold environment for 1,500 years, and it warms back up really quickly. And it's more or less in the warm interglacial environment that we're living in today. Mm. But what we know from the Pleistocene epoch is that those types of climate changes occurred many times in the past, and we didn't see the scale of extinction that we have at the end of the Pleistocene. Mm. So what's the difference? Well, the difference is geologically shortly before this extinction event, humans get here. And we know from many different places that when humans get to certain areas, generally extinction follows them. If we look at the habitats that are present in New York State, the habitats that these animals prefer are absolutely present in the state at that time. So the habitats that they prefer are here, but they're still going extinct. Mm -hmm. So to me, maybe climate change affected something of their population sizes, but humans had to have some influence. But in recent developments in the scientific world, there's been discussion of the possibility of bringing either a mastodon or a mammoth back to life using a process called genetic transformation. I don't know if anybody's talked about really bringing a dinosaur back. Uh, I hope they don't. But what are your thoughts on, A, is it scientifically possible? And B, is it something that we should do? I don't think... I'm certain that we'll never have the genetic material to recreate a dinosaur. Mm. They do have whole genomes of mammoth and mastodon. However, you're never going to recreate this creature as it was in life. What you may create is a hairy elephant. I don't think they would ever be able to utilize a, an elephant egg as for genetic material for a mastodon. I don't think... I'm not certain that would work. Mm -hmm. But in my opinion, you'll, you'll never get what they're trying to get, is to recreate the exact species. I don't know what really the point of it is, in that when we talk about species and we study the species, species have a particular niche. That is specific to that particular animal. The types of environments that are around today were not around mm -hmm. 25,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. 30,000 years ago. The habitats that we have today are absolutely different from what the habitats were like when those animals were alive. It seems to me that it would be much a better use of finances if you're really concerned about conservation and conservation biology to utilize those funds instead of recreating something that you're really not ever going to recreate anyway, mm. but to utilize it to study and understand the ecosystems of today and how we might prevent further extinctions of animals that we have around today, mm. whether that be just buying up land so animals have space to live mm -hmm. um, or making sure that specific species survive. Thanks for listening to a New York Minute in History. This podcast is a production of WAMC Northeast Public Radio, the New York State Museum, and Archivist Media, with support from the William G. Pomeroy Foundation. Our producer is Jesse King. A big thanks to Dr. Bob Ferranic and Bernard Means for taking part in this month's episode. To learn more about our guests and the show, check us out at wamcpodcast.org. I'm Devin Lander. And I'm Lauren Roberts. Until next time, Excelsior! Excelsior.